When I was a graduate student, one of the most memorable classes I took examined corporate failures. Most business schools study success stories, like Apple computers. We studied companies that went bankrupt, like Osborne computers. Yeah, you haven't heard of them, have you? <laughs> failure has become a hot topic recently, but the Bible has been talking about failure for thousands of years. The Book of Kings tells the story of many failures, how Solomon's sin led to the division of the monarchy, how Jeroboam's sin plagued the northern kingdom, and how persistent apostasy resulted in exile for both the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Why would anyone want to read such a depressing story? Because one can learn from failure, ideally when other people are doing the failing. Everyone experiences failures in life, but not everyone learns from them. The Book of Kings tells a tragic story that is meant to be instructive as it teaches lessons about God, idolatry, and obedience. Now, some readers might find the sections with a lot of dates boring, <laughs> but, in, but Kings includes something for everyone. For animal lovers, the book has bears, birds, dogs, horses, and lions. If miracles are your thing, you'll read about food deliveries by ravens, never-ending jugs and jars, lightning falling from heaven, salt purifying a poison spring, a flour purifying a poison stew, a foreign general healed of leprosy, and a dead man's corpse being revived by the bones of Elisha. Sounds like the walking dead. But the most fascinating part of Kings, however, is the main character, God himself. As he speaks, heals, judges, sends fiery chariots, and even talks trash. The kings of kings consistently fail to live up to God's standards, leaving readers longing for a future ruler, a descendant of David who will bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, an investment in the book of kings will be richly rewarded. First and second kings were originally one book, it was divided because it was too long to fit into one scroll. So in this video, I'll just call it Kings. As one book, it's actually the longest book in the Bible. Now, different traditions have different names for the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Jewish tradition calls them the former prophets. Scholars call them the Deuteronomistic history. Christians often just call them the historical books. Kings is about kings, which sounds straightforward, but can be confusing because the book records the reigns of 40 kings, two from the United Monarchy, 19 from the Southern Kingdom of Judah, and 19 from the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And five pairs of rulers have the same name, Jeroboam, Ahaziah, Jehoram, Jehoash, and Jehoahaz. It's confusing even for Bible scholars. To hopefully reduce confusion, let me just define some terms. The United Monarchy refers to the United Nation during the reigns of David and Solomon. The Divided Monarchy refers to the period when there were two kingdoms, the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Southern Kingdom of Judah. Judah alone refers to the period after the exile of the Northern Kingdom, when it was just Judah alone. It's actually not that complicated. We're going to talk about literary issues for a little bit now. Like most Old Testament books, Kings mentions no author. And the process of composition was probably complicated with multiple authors, editors, and scribes. For the sake of simplicity, I will just speak of the book's author. Now, the book itself mentions three historical sources. The Annals of Solomon are only mentioned once in 1 Kings 11. The Annals of the Kings of Israel are mentioned 17 times. The Annals of the Kings of Judah are mentioned 15 times. The author of Kings would have needed these royal records to write the book, since the book is narrating a 400-year history of the monarchy. I'm going to talk a little bit about Deuteronomistic redaction. Now, much of the scholarly research on the Book of Kings 
focuses on the question of how the sources behind the Book of Kings were edited or redacted. Language and themes from the Book of Deuteronomy appear to have been added to the earlier source material. Scholars call this process Deuteronomistic redaction. And then the four books that were redacted in this way, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, the Deuteronomistic history. Now, there are several different theories of how this might have happened. There could have been one Deuteronomistic redactor, or two Deuteronomistic redactors, or three Deuteronomistic redactors, or maybe just a whole school of Deuteronomistic redactors. While the presence of Deuteronomistic language and themes in Kings is undeniable, it's unlikely that scholars will ever agree on the process of how it happened. One of the distinguishing features of kings are the regnal formulas. Some people, not you, <laughs> may find the regnal formulas boring, but they pr provide important information about the history of the monarchy. Kings contains 38 regnal formulas, 19 for the northern kingdom and 19 for the southern kingdom. The formulas for the northern and southern rulers are similar but they have distinctive features. I've displayed a sample for you of the Israelite ruler Jehoahaz in this table. So Israelite regnal formulas typically include seven components. The synchronism dates the beginning of the Israelites ruler reign relative to the number of years that the Judean ruler has already been on the throne. The father's name was used to identify an individual like a last name is often used today. Reign length is the only element to appear in all formulas for both Israel and Judah. The evaluation records whether the, the ruler was righteous or more likely evil. The explanation explains why they were righteous uh, or evil. And then usually there's some narrative material inserted at this point. The annals reference is a little bit like a footnote and we'll talk more about that later. And then it concludes with the death notice tells us the king died and then just who his successor was. Judean regnal formulas are pretty similar to those for their northern neighbors. And I've also displayed a table here for a Judean regnal formula for jo Joash. Judean regular formulas typically include nine elements. Six of these have appeared in those of Israel. The synchronism is from the Judean perspective this time. Explanations are different. Israelite rulers um, were compared to Jeroboam I, but Judean rulers are compared to a variety of other people. Fathers, David, or perhaps other rulers. Southern regnal formulas include three distinct elements from the northern ones. The mother's name is included, um, not the father's, because since the father was just the previous ruler. The accession age states when the, the ruler took the throne. Nine Judean rulers are associated with high places, locations of idolatrous worship. Now, while we might not love them, these formulas give structure to a long narrative which covers 400 years of history. The Book of Kings is not merely about kings, but as part of the former prophets, it is, not surprisingly, also about prophets. Prophets dominate long sections of the text and serve as the heroes of the story. Most kings do evil in the eyes of Yahweh, but most prophets speak and act for Yahweh. The book of Kings has more occurrences of terms associated with prophets than any other Old Testament book. Now, prophetic messages can be categorized into three types. Prophets give counsel to kings during periods of crisis or warfare. Prophets make predictions involving life and death, drought and rain, defeat and victory, and deliverance and destruction. Prophets deliver judgments targeting a variety of sins, including idolatry, disobedience, injustice, greed, and bloodshed. Prophets were the real heroes of the Book of Kings. God is the focus of the history of Kings. Yahweh is mentioned over 500 times throughout the book. God may seem passive at times, but he's constantly working, speaking through prophets, empowering miracles, judging and blessing rulers, and controlling nations and emperors. To understand the historical context of kings, 
I will look at how the surrounding empires related to Israel and Judah during this period. Egypt plays a significant role, particularly at the beginning and end of the book. By marrying Pharaoh's daughter, Solomon cemented an alliance with Egypt early in his reign. However, King Shishak of Egypt ended this alliance by attacking Solomon's son Rehoboam and plundering the temple. After a long gap, Egypt reemerged as an active player at the end of Kings when Pharaoh Necho of Egypt killed Josiah at Megiddo. Assyria doesn't appear in the book of Kings until late in the history of the northern kingdom. After a period of Assyrian decline, Tiglath-Pileser III reasserted Assyrian dominance in the region by extracting tribute from Menachem, conquering most of Israel under Pekah, and taking captives to Assyria. The sons of Tiglath-Pileser, Shalmanazar V and his brother Sargon II, besieged Samaria, the northern capital, conquered Israel, and exiled the remainder of the nation. Thus ended the northern kingdom in 722 BC. Sargon's son, Sennacherib, invaded Judah, captured cities, forced a tribute from Hezekiah, and besieged Jerusalem. In response to Hezekiah's prayer, Yahweh retaliated with a slaughter of Assyrian soldiers. Babylon replaced Assyria as the dominant power in the region. During the reign of Hezekiah, Marduk Baladan of Babylon sent a delegation to Hezekiah, and Isaiah rebuked the king for his naivete for showing them all his treasures. After his victory over Egypt and Assyria at Carchemish, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon conquered Jerusalem, took many of his citizens back to Babylon, and in response to Zedekiah's rebellion, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem again, destroyed the city and the temple, and deported more residents in 587 BC. Even though the emperors of Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon had great power, the book of Kings makes it clear that Yahweh is sovereign over all kingdoms and rulers. God is the primary character in the book, and the primary theological message of the book is that God judges his own people even while sending them into exile, while Yahweh looked for a worship and obedience, both his people and his leaders often responded with rebellion and idolatry. The text honors kings who worshiped Yahweh properly, like David, Hezekiah, and Josiah, and condemns the ones who didn't, like Jeroboam, Ahab, and Manasseh. Two types of improper worship practices are condemned frequently in kings. Almost all northern rulers are criticized for continuing the sins of Jeroboam. Mainly southern rulers are condemned for worshiping at or not removing the high places because they were associated with idolatrous worship practices. While all idolatrous practices were common, five rulers, Asa, Jehu, Joash, Hezekiah, and Josiah, instituted religious reforms. Besides condemning idolatry, the book emphasizes obedience in other ways by showing how rulers who obey God's law are rewarded and those who disobey him are judged. Ultimately, God condemns both Israel and Judah to exile because of the disobedience of not just the kings, but the entire nation. I'll briefly highlight two other forms of disobedience. God condemns the greed of Ahab and Jezebel as they steal their neighbor's vineyard and have him killed. Elisha's servant Gehazi is cursed with leprosy by Elisha for his greed and deception. Foreign marriage was forbidden in Deuteronomy 7, and both Solomon and Ahab were condemned for it because their wives contributed to their idolatry. Well, kings ruled over Israel and Judah, prophets, priests, and key women exercised leadership gifts in the spiritual realm by speaking the words of God, calling people to obey, and confronting idolatry. The primary spiritual leaders during the period of the monarchy were the prophets, which include three famous ones, Elijah, Elisha, and Isaiah, as well as some less famous ones, Ahijah, Micaiah, and Huldah. While they healed people 
and met physical needs, primarily prophets served as God's spokespersons. We have a lot to learn from these prophets about confronting power, defaming idols, and calling for exclusive worship of God. Compared to prophets, priests are generally minor characters in kings. For much of the divided monarchy, priests are mentioned only briefly until Jehoiada, the priest, serves as kingmaker for the sole surviving son of Ahaziah, orchestrating the rebellion against Athaliah and restoring a descendant of David to the throne. During Josiah's renovations of the temple, Hilkiah, the priest, finds the book of the law, which serves as an inspiration for Josiah's reforms. While women typically lacked official roles, they still wielded influence and lead the men around them. When Athaliah took power after the death of her son Ahaziah and slaughtered the remainder of the royal family, Jehoshaphat risked her life to save her one-year-old nephew, Joash, until he could become king six years later. This relatively unknown princess rescued not only her nephew, but also prevented the Davidic line of Jesus from being exterminated. After the priest Hilkiah found the book of the law, King Josiah didn't consult the prophet Jeremiah, but the prophetess Huldah, who interpreted it for him. In contrast to the disobedient rulers who reigned during the ministries of Elijah and Elisha, two widows faithfully obeyed the prophetic word. The story of how God worked through an unnamed Israelite servant girl to heal Naaman is one of the most dramatic examples of faithfulness and compassion in Scripture. That's in 2 Kings 5. This Israelite servant girl not only displayed profound confidence in God's ability to heal foreign lepers, but she also demonstrated radical compassion by loving her foreign enemy. Prophets, priests, and women all play supporting roles in the book, but Kings is primarily about kings. And while the political rulers of Israel and Judah should have provided spiritual leadership for their respective nations, in this capacity, they utterly failed. And the idolatrous behavior of these evil rulers had a devastating impact on the people. In the midst of a preponderance of apostasy and idolatry, two positive examples of kings who exercised spiritual leadership for their nation stand out. After the temple was finished, Solomon led the nation in a dedication prayer, a sacrifice, and a celebration. As the culmination of his reformation in response to finding the book of the law, Josiah celebrated the Passover and commanded the nation to continue the practice. But even the most righteous rulers of kings all had serious problems, leaving us longing for a future truly righteous son of David, the ultimate king of kings and lord of lords.